So if you guys would like to turn to Psalms 51 with me today. The joy of your salvation. The joy of your salvation. Now just a little, <clears throat> little context here. This is a prayer of David. This is a psalm of repentance. It's because the prophet Nathan came to him back in Samuel 2.12 And basically told him a story about a parable about a man who stole another man's sheep and then ate it, even though he had plenty. And David was angry with this man who stole the sheep. And then Nathan said, that's you who stole the sheep. And he wept and cried. And this is one of the Psalms that came from it. Now, stay with me, church. Stay with me. For the joy of your salvation, God. Hmm. Here we go. Verse 1, a plea for forgiveness. Have mercy upon me, O God, according to your love and kindness and according to the multitude of your tender mercies. Blot out my transgressions and wash me thoroughly from my iniquities and cleanse me from my sins. See, verse 1 and 2 is so important because David is making a declaration before, or he's making a proclamation before the demonstration comes. Before the repentance takes place in his heart, he's declaring the love of the Father. Repentance has to be one that is in the presence of love and mercies of God. And David, even though he wept and he felt horrible for what he did because he murdered a man and stole his wife and there was deep sorrow within his heart and deep pain within his life, everything was a mess around him and all these things. And yet before he went into this, he says, Father, let your love and kindness be upon me. Let your mercies, your adoring mercies, your everlasting love, Father God. See, a believer... Oh, I'm getting ahead of myself. Hold on. (laughs) Stay with me. Don't leave. Don't leave. (sighs) Let's say it again. David is a man with many sorrows. His heart is broken. He's hurt. He's a man of authority. He's a man after God's own heart. And here he sits in the face of sin. And he's standing in front of the things that he's done by his own hand. And he's wounded. He's devastated. And he says, now listen, when I read this list, try to to put yourself there if you're not there already. He says, have mercy upon me, O God, according to your love and kindness, according to the multitude of your tender mercies. Blot out my transgressions, wash me thoroughly from my iniquities, and cleanse me from my sins. It's a plea. He's crying out to God. He's begging him. It's a glorious, 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 glorious position of a saint. When he calls out to God and he says, Father, have mercy upon me. Be kind to me, God. Be generous with your spirit, Father God. Precious. Offer of confession. So first he goes and he says, Father, have mercy upon me. And he sets the stage of repentance because he sets in the love of God. 
He sets himself in the love of God. He sets himself in the kindness of God. And from that place, we offer our confession. It's from that place we offer our confession. It isn't from condemnation. It isn't from guilt and shame. It's from the love and kindness and the mercy of the Father. It's from this. We have to hold on to verse 1. Verse 1 is the hinge pin of everything when it comes to Christianity. Everything. It's not just a little, it's all. So from this place, he offers up offer of confession. Verse 3, he says, For I acknowledge my transgressions and my sins is always before me. Against you only have I sinned and done this evil in your sight that you may, find, may be found just when you speak and blameless when you judge. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity and in sin my mother conceived me. Behold, your desire, truth in the inward parts and in the inward and in hidden parts you have made me to... And in the hidden parts you make me to know wisdom. Listen, watch. Watch this, church. First he sets in the love of God. And listen, I love David's heart. This is why it's a, heart after God, a man after God's own heart. He could blame a lot of things. He could say it's Bathsheba's fault. He could say it's the kingdom's fault. He could, he could pass the buck real easy. How many of you know leaders are good at that? And King David was a mighty leader. But he didn't. He didn't. Watch this. He says, for I acknowledge my transgressions. The beauty, the beauty of a saint to come to a king and say, look what I've done. This is beautiful. This isn't bad. This is glorious. I personally, and I know God does too, all of heaven, all of heaven was cheering when David fell on his face and wept. Shouts in the streets. <sighs> Jesus on his throne. Yes. Yes. Intercede on his behalf. Yes. Oh, the beauty, the glory. When a man acknowledges who they are and where they're at. Oh, saints. And we're going to get there. Watch. Watch. I almost jumped ahead. <laughs> almost jumped ahead. For I acknowledge my transgressions and my sins are always before me against you and you only have I sinned. Church, when a saint begins to realize that his sin and his shortcomings are against God and not each other, now each other is a byproduct. And it might be a direct thing we did to somebody as he did to Bathsheba and Uriah. But David understood that it was ultimately against God. Right? But watch this. It was ultimately against God. And he confessed. But he confessed from a position of being loved. He said, for your love and kindness is always upon me. And it's from this position of love and kindness that he confessed his faults unto the Father. And he said, Father, my sins are always before me, and only you have I sinned against. Only you, Father God. And he wept. that you may be found just when you speak. See, the Father is just when he speaks to his children. He's perfect, full of compassion and love. He cares for you. And I'm going to go back to this often, but it's from that place that repentance is fruitful. And it brings life. 
and it changes us so that we don't become this habitual repeater over and over and over and over the same stuff because I've been guilty of that. I was that sorrow repenter, and really what I was sorry for was the emotions that I felt and the feelings I had behind it. And really what I was saying was, Father, help me feel better. And I'm not saying the Father doesn't help you feel better, but what I was trying to do is repent out of the bad feeling of the sin that I've created in my life. And I was trying to run from that. And then what happened, as soon as I felt that, or as soon as I got out of the shame and guilt or the shadow of that, I'd run from it, and I'd be like, oh, that was holy, holy, holy. And I'd run right back to it. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> uh, okay, 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 okay. I'll be good. I'll be good. I'll be good. <laughs> Lord, oh, Father's all, come on, son. Come on. I'm sorry, Dad. You created me. (laughs) Amen, amen, amen. Preach it. So watch, verse 5. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity and sin. My mother conceived me. Behold... See, I'm going to share something with you guys. See, God never gave you the ability to reason out of truth. That was from Adam. Adam gave you the ability to reason out of truth. He gave you the ability to deny truth. He gave you the ability to, to, to come and defeat self. That was Adam. Thank you, Adam. Let's say it together. Thank you, Adam. It's your fault. It's his fault. Dang, Adam. Here's a little side note. I had this revelation. This has nothing to do with this message, but watch. I was praying, right? And uh, I was talking about listening. I was teaching in Repu Recovery. And I was talking about how we listen. And it dawned on me that I think the second that Adam ate the fruit because he listened to Eve, the second he bit the fruit, he was the first man that said, huh? What? (laughs) What'd you say? I didn't hear you. Huh? Huh? (laughs) <laughs> I think he was the first because he said, here, eat. He listened, ate it, and couldn't hear no more. He's gone. So ask the Lord to heal your ears so that we can hear each other again. Heal our ears. Sorry, that's, I, that's my ADHD kicking in. See, watch this. 2 Corinthians 7, 10 and 11 says this. For godly sorrow produces repentance leading to salvation. Not to be regarded, but the sorrow of the world produces death. That's what I was talking about earlier. There was a time where I had this worldly sorrow, this worldly sorrow that was in me so deep, and I was constantly repenting from worldly sorrow, but it was only producing death in me. It was only producing death in me because really what I was was sorry about the world I had, sorry about the things I produced, sorry about this and these worldly things, and I was in this repetitive cycle of repentance over the same thing over and over again, and I never found freedom from them. Until one day, I read this, and I went, what? There it is. There it is, Father. He said, verse 11, for observe this very thing. Observe this very thing. That your sorrow, that you sorrowed in a godly manner. This is what David was doing. He he sorrowed in a godly manner. He, He came to the Father, and he said, forgive me, God, for I've sinned against you. He sorrowed in a godly manner, in a godly way, in a way that was in the love of the Father, that was in the kindness and the mercies of a king, that was at the throne room, the feet of Jesus, where it says it is finished. And he says this, watch. He says, observe this very thing, verse 11, 2 Corinthians 7, and I'm spitting all over the place. He says... For observe this very thing that you're sorrowed in a godly manner. What diligence it produces in you. What clearing of yourself. What indignation, what fear, what vehement desire, what zeal, what vindication in all things you're proving yourself to be clear in this matter. Did you hear that? 
Listen, I'm not excited for God because I'm crazy. Oh, I'm excited because he's the king and I've experienced this church and I want you to experience it too. That when I sorrow about what I've done wrong, I sorrow in a godly manner and I come to the king and I come to the throne room where he loves me and he lavishes me with gifts and he lavishes me with hope and he lavishes me with pride, uh, not pride, with uh, humbleness and humility. <sighs> oh, I got excited, lost my breath. Hold on. Let me read it again. He says, 2 Corinthians, I want you to remember this, 7, 10, and 11. For godly sorrow produces repentance leading to salvation. Not to be regretted, but the sorrow of the world produces death. For observe this very thing. Observe means to look at intently, to watch, to continually be a part of, to let it be a part of who you are. Let it be something you see daily. Let it be something you operate daily. Let it be something that is in your heart and in your life. Observe it. Let it be so, he says. Observe this very thing that you sorrow in a godly manner with. It says what diligence it produces in you. Who can use a little diligence? Hmm? <laughs> what clearing of yourself. What clearing of yourself. I love that. When I read that means clearing of self. What clearing of self. What indignation, what fear, what vehement desire, what zeal, what vindication in all things proving yourself to be clear in this matter. <sighs> how precious, how wonderful. Forgiveness and cleansing through the blood. We're going to keep moving on. I'll sit on that all day. Doctor, he meant it. Two hours. Yeah. I heard him. <laughs> I love Dr. E. Tell you what, he's been the best pastor I've ever had. Forgiveness and cleansing through the blood. Psalms 51, 7 through 10. Verse 7, purge me with hyssop and I shall be clean. Wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. Mm. See, in the Old Testament, they would use a herb called hyssop. And the high priest would cleanse you with water or with blood. Jesus Christ is the ultimate sacrifice. When he's come, this is a foreshadowing of Christ coming. This is a foreshadowing of Christ. David understood these things. By what? By the Holy Spirit. He understood this. He said, purge me with hyssop and I shall be clean. Wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. Here again, David is understanding that repentance is an understanding of what we did, but it's bringing it to the Father for the cleansing. It's bringing it to God for the healing. It's bringing it to God for the vehement desire. It's bringing it to God for the zeal. It's bringing it to, that we would sorrow in a godly manner that we would let truth be the thing that sets us free and not worldly sorrow, but godly sorrow. Yes. Church. Mm. I'm so excited. Listen. We spend too much time sorrowing in a worldly manner. Expecting godly results. doesn't work. Trust me, I tried it. I was a chronic relapser on methamphetamines and drugs and abuse and all kinds of things for 10 years. And it's because I was this worldly sorrower. Because I had this, I had a small revelation of God and that small revelation was this, that God was just here to make me feel better. Not that he was here to transform me. And I've said it often, pain will get you through that door. But God will transform you. See, we look at repentance as a taboo. Oh, I tell you, I love it. I run to it. I love it. After reading uh, 2 Corinthians 7, 
it produces something in me when I sorrow in a godly manner. It's beautiful, it's precious. Repentance is nothing like it used to be. It used to, repentance used to be like this guilt-driven thing where I was just trying to get out of guilt and shame and I was just running from it. And something happened, which I believe is gonna happen to you. You know why? Somebody say why. Oh, I'm glad you asked. Man, glad you guys asked. I'm going to tell you. Because I believe in all my heart when I speak, it's in the power of God. Not because I am special. Because I believe. That's it. That's it. I believe. I believe. When I pray for you, things happen. Holy Spirit shows up and he moves. It's not because I prayed a bunch or know the word a bunch. It's because I believe. That's it. I believe. I believe. So, now I got to move on. Holy moly. He says, purge me with hyssop and I shall be clean. Wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. Make me hear joy and gladness that the bones you have broken may rejoice. Listen, he said God broke his bones. That's hard for us to hear. Most of us think that's because God's mad at us. No, 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 no. No, 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 no. When God put me in prison, because I believe it was God, it was grace. It was grace. When God put me on my face and and arrested me and put me in rehab and a divorce came over and all these things that were horrible in my life happened to me, it was grace. I'm not saying God caused it. I'm saying God used it. Saying God used my struggles to manifest something in me as he did David, that he would manifest this godly sorrow within me, that I would be transformed and set free. So good. First, 1 John 1, 1.8 says this, if, I, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, if we confess our sins, he is faithful. Who? He. he. Who's he? Who? God. The Father. It's capital H. I love the capital H. I'm all, oh, it's a capital H. Yes. <laughs> he says he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. Church, you want me to say that now, Father? Okay. Church, most of us, if not all of us, we have this declaration when we meet people, I'm a sinner saved by grace. Is that not true? Sinner saved by grace. But we carry that as if it's a continual thing. Hear me out. We carry that as if it's a continual thing. Listen, a sinner saved by grace was a one-time transaction. One. It happened one time. One time. See, prior to God, you were a sinner who struggled with God. And sinning by nature was easy. You were a liar, a hypocrite, a bastard, all these things, right? You were all these things by nature. But listen, Paul refers to us as saints for a reason. He says that when Christ comes in me, he says it right there, that he will cleanse me from all unrighteousness. Cleanse means a one-time deal. It doesn't mean cleaning. Mm. Mm. You guys hear that? What is that? What? Sorry. Sorry. I, I really do have ADHD. It's crazy. Should I grab the mic? Okay, I got to grab the mic. I don't know. Check, check. Wow, that's so much louder. <laughs> okay. So watch. You are a a sinner saved by grace. 
It was a one-time transaction, and then you became a saint. But how many of us identify just as sinners? You're not. You're a saint. Paul ref 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 refers to you as saints. And the reason you're saint is because what he did on the cross. The reason you're saint is because he clothed you in righteousness and forgives you of all unrighteousness. The reason you're a saint is because he endows you with power and authority and anointing of God and the Holy Spirit dwells in the temple. A Holy what the? Oh. A Holy Spirit cannot dwell in a temple that's not holy. It's Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit. He dwells in a temple that's made holy and covered in the blood of Christ. But we walk around minimizing the power of God by just calling us saints. Oh, we're just saints saved by grace. No, that was a one-time transaction. You are a saint. And watch this. David is a saint. Watch, guys. When before salvation came, I was a sinner who struggled with God. Now that I have Holy Spirit in me, I am a saint who struggles with sin. When I was a sinner, I struggled with God. I became saved and I became a saint who struggles with sin. I'm not a sinner. I struggle with it. I'm a saint. Endowed with power. Holy Spirit dwells in this temple because I am holy. That's not self-righteous. That's not ego. That's not prideful. That's truth. It's truth. And watch this. When you act in a way that's not befitting to the new identity and you feel dirty, it's because you are clean. Wow. Clean things cannot feel dirty if they're already dirty. Right? Right? If you're clean and you act in a way that is unbefitting to who you are and it makes you feel a certain way, it's because you are clean. Clean. Sanctified. Holy. Set apart. A peculiar people. You're supposed to not feel good when you do something that is not befitting to who you are. That is the grace of God speaking to you to saying, son, don't do this. I'll share a story with you. First time I got saved, my first relapse after getting saved, uh, I got saved and was sober for a year and a half, and then I ended up relapsing, and I relapsed really bad. I ended up disappearing from my, I lived in Washington, and I left my wife and my kids, and I took all the rent money and went to a dope house and spent it all and left them with no food and no money. Yeah. And I remember sitting in that dope house. And some of you guys know what I'm talking about when I say dope house. I'm talking about a dope house. And I'm sitting in there doing drugs of all kinds and all sorts. My son just visited me from, from, from Colorado. Do you remember that, son? And I ditched him. And they had to go back. They had to come back to Colorado. I relapsed. And I'm sitting in this house with all these meth, meth addicts and drug addicts and everything, and I'm sitting there. And for the first time, listen, I'd been saved for a year and a half and never really heard, heard the Holy Spirit speak to me. And I'd been high for like three weeks, and all of a sudden I'm sitting there in this dark place, and I hear the Lord say, I will never leave you nor forsake you. And I cussed him out. <laughs> I'm like, get out of here. The Lord said he's come for the sick, not the well. And he sat with me. And I want to let you guys know that I, for 10 years I was a chronic relapser, but I, the Lord was there with me every time. Every time. I really have to move on. Spirit filled for joy and power. Psalms 51, 11, and 12. Do not cast me away from your presence and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and uphold me by your generous spirit. I want you guys to understand something there. The reason that this message is the joy of your salvation is a lot of times some translations say the joy of my salvation. The joy of your, the joy of your salvation, it's not your salvation. He's talking about his salvation. The joy of your salvation, Father. The joy and power of your anointing God. That it would fall upon me, Father. And that I would receive it. 
Joy isn't based on how much work I do and how well I am in ministry and how much I've prayed and how much I've prayed for people. It's your joy, Father God. It's the joy of your love for me and your kindness, Lord God, that I get to sit in and receive, Father God. That it's relational, Father God. It's not religious. It's, it's, it's understanding the truth that David oh so understood so long ago. Jude one twenty four says this, now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling. I, that's what it says. <laughs> now to him, capital H, who's he talking about? God. To him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. See, when I go to the throne room, I go faultless. When I pray to God, it's faultless. It's not one of condemnation and, and pain and, and all these other things that come with worldly sorrow. Because I've come to this place where godly sorrow is, is what sets me free. Because I read truth like that. And trust me, church, I still fall short, but my leash is very small. I fall short, I see it, I run to the throne room of grace where I'll find mercy and grace in a time of need. Why? Because he says so, because I'm a child, because I've been holy, I've been set free, because I'm allowed to go there. I'm giving you permission to come to the Father if you need it today. You have permission. No matter where you're at in your life, no matter how much you feel you've fallen short, he says it. Watch, I'll read it again. Oh, you guys are in for it. Jude 124. I love that little book. He says, now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling. Hmm. Hmm. <laughs> to him who is able to keep you from stumbling. And to present you <laughs> faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. Isaiah 61, 3 says this, the counsel to counsel those who mourn in Zion, to give beauty from ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise to the spirit of heaviness, that they may be called trees of righteousness, planted to the Lord, that he may be glorified, glorified. So watch, all this is to say that David was a king and he had a calling. He, was, he had a calling to be a warrior and a king, to set people free, to set Israel free. He had a calling and he did something that was outside of his calling. He came to God through the love of God and the kindness of his mercy. He repented, he didn't, he didn't blame people, he didn't say it was their fault. He laid it before the throne and said, Father, I have godly sorrow. Why did he do that? He did it right here. Watch verse 13. So that he can get back in the service of his calling. Watch. It's gorgeous. It's beautiful. Verse sweating. <sighs> yes, Lord. Let me read these to you. First, he pleads for forgiveness. Then he offers up his confession. Then forgiveness and cleansing through the blood. Then spirit filled for joy and power. For what? For service. For what? See, David fell short in sin because he was making it about him and he forgot about his calling. When we turn upward and then look outward, we're empowered and anointed to do the calling that God has for us. When we turn inward and downward, we feel very small and unworthy. But David took that place where he was sinning and he turned it upward. For what? So verse 13 says it right here. Then I will teach transgressors your ways and sinners shall be converted to you. How precious is that? How precious is that? See, it's the joy of the Lord, the joy of his salvation in my heart that I get to manifest and, and, and minister to people. I get to do that because I have a godly sorrow. Church, I am not proclaiming I have anything better than you. I fall short all the time. I'm a man. Can I get an amen? 
I'm a man, right? But I go through this succession of repentance as David lays out for us. Because it's truth. It's holiness. For what? So that I can get back on the horse. So I can get back into the service of the king. So that I can get off of my soapbox and get back to finding people and being there for people and being of service and being of help and helping people find truth and being set free so that they would be a new beginning for them so that they wouldn't be stuck in drugs and alcohol and porn and lies and misery and all these things. But how am I to do that if I'm worldly sorrowing? Right? How? I've never met a Christian who is wor- steeped in worldly sorrow be effective in any way. And it's not a hit against you. It's not. If you're there, it's to open your eyes so that you would see that's where you're at so you can move out of it. Watch, he says it. I will teach transgressors your ways and sinners shall be converted to you. <laughs> <laughs> James 5, 19, 20 says this, brethren, if anyone among you wanders from the truth and someone turns him back, let him know that he has turned a sinner from the errors of his ways, of his ways will save a soul from death and cover a multitude of sins. And then the last one is this, worship, worship. I love Psalms 51. Watch this. Verse 14 through 7 says this. Deliver me from the guilt of bloodshed, O God, the God of my salvation, and my tongue shall sing aloud of your righteousness. O Lord, open my lips, and my mouth shall shew forth your praises. Hmm. Would the band come up? (laughs) (laughs) The joy of your salvation, God. That was proclamation. I love what Dr. E taught about a few weeks ago. Now we're going to do a little demonstration. If that is you and you're struggling with worldly sorrow and you find yourself repeating this over and over and over again and you can't seem to get out of that cycle, David presented a pattern for us to walk in. It's a pattern. And I've learned this pattern. That when I fall short, I do it in a godly way. And it's like that old saying, if you're going to fall, fall forward. Haven't you guys heard that before? When I fall, I fall to my knees to the king. When I make a mistake, it's in the love of God, in the, in the, in the kindness of God. And I tell you, I'm not perfect, but I'm way better than I've ever been because I've experienced the godly sorrow of a king. Not a worldly sorrow. If that is you, would you guys stand? Well, all of you stand. But if that's you and you're struggling with some, listen, I did a proclamation, now we wanna do a demonstration. A demonstration is that you would be healed from this. If you're struggling with that, you could stay in your seat and raise your hand, that's fine, but, the, but a declaration, would you guys would be come up front and come to this altar? We're not going to do anything weird. Actually, I am. I am. I can't lie to you. I'm sorry. I'm going to do something weird for sure. <laughs> if that's you, come forward. Don't be shy. Be bold as lions. No matter what your position is in authority in God, If you struggle with worldly sorrow and repeating the same thing over and over and over, come forward. Would some of my prayer team come up here? There's, oh, they're coming up here, yeah. See, I've gone long and I'm sorry. But that's okay. Come on, there's a few more of you, I know. I'm gonna be patient. Any more worldly sorrows? 
said it all weird, sorrowers, I can't even say it right, anymore, see, we'll go till two o'clock if we have to, not really, okay, oh, okay, Hold, uh, we're going to just do a generic prayer, Dr. E, it's not generic, yeah, yes, pastorally pray, would you guys lift your hands? Father, I thank you, Lord God. I thank you for David's pattern that he has shown forth for us. I thank you, Lord God, that you put that, that, that verse in there in 2 Corinthians 7 for us to learn, Father, that there is a difference. I ask, Holy Spirit, that you would bring the joy of your salvation upon each and every one of us today so that we would step back into the service of God, Father God, and not sit in this worldly sorrow anymore that we will be set free and full of joy and worship for you, Father God. I ask, Father God, that you would cleanse everyone standing up here and anybody in their seats, Father God, that needs it, that you would cleanse us with the authority and the power of God, Father God, that we would learn how to sorrow in a godly way, that it would uh, 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 set us ablaze and in fire for you, God. In Jesus' name I pray, I bless you. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We're going to worship. If you need to go get your kids, go get them. But stay if you need to do some business. If you need prayer, find somebody. We love you. Thanks for tuning in to a message from the Sanctuary Church. For more information and media, go to our website at thesanctuarywestside.org or follow us on Facebook, Twitter, or YouTube.